world concerns. We've got the six last talks of the conference. Uh, I'd like to welcome Guillaume up for the first talk. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. This is a joint work with my colleagues from Deezer and Ecole Polytechnique. So, as you might know, on the profile page of an artist, music streaming services such as Deezer will frequently recommend a ranked list of similar artists that fans also liked. Such a feature takes different names, fans also like, related artists, but in a sense, they are often based on artist similarity measures computed from usage data. For instance, from the proportion of common fans or from more complex collaborative filtering measures. Similar artists are actually crucial for music streaming services. Spotify even described them as, I quote, one of the easiest ways to let users discover new music. Nonetheless, computing such lists is especially challenging for new artists. Indeed, we might have access to general descriptions of these artists, such as their music genres, but usage data, listening data from users, will not be available at the beginning. And as a consequence of this problem, which we refer to as the cold start similar artist ranking problem, well, we do not recommend fans also like sections for new artists, not until a sufficiently large number of usage interactions had been reached. Importantly, besides new artists, this approach will also exclude from recommendations a potentially large part of the catalog with too few listening data, which can raise fairness concerns. And last, while I focus on music, the problem is also challenging for media recommending other items, such as videos. So that's what we wanted to address. More formally, I will consider a catalog of n items, each item i as a descriptive vector xi. So for artists, xi could include their country of origins or their music genres, okay? I will also assume that the items are warm. It means that according to criteria fixed by the service, we have enough usage data, so enough likes or streams to ensure reliable usage data analysis. And then from this usage data, the service will learn a similarity matrix. I will come back to it, and it is detailed in the paper, but so far I will simply assume its existence, because the problem would be valid for any artist similarity score between zero and one, okay? What you have to keep in mind is, is that the service will use this similarity, this similarity to propose a fans also like feature. So for each item I, we will recommend K other items the top K ones with highest similarity scores, okay? The problem is that on a regular basis, cold items will appear in the catalog. So we will have their descriptive vectors, but no usage data. And what we want to do is to predict the list that should be recommended in the future. But we would like to do so, of course, from the delivery of this item, so without any usage data. That would enable offering such recommendations quicker and on the larger part of the catalog. So in our work, we argue that fans also like can actually naturally be summarized as a graph. So in this graph, the N nodes would be the warm items, and each item would point to its K most similar neighbors. By nature, such a graph would verify several properties. First of all, it would be a weighted graph, because among the K neighbors of node I, some items are more similar to I than others, and that's why we want to rank them. So each edge will have a weight, which is the similarity score. The graph will also be directed, because sometimes, you know, the fans of an artist A will listen to the artist B, but the fans of B will not listen to the artist A. I give specific examples in the paper, and actually, most of the time, the relationships will be asymmetric. Last, the graph will be attributed. It means that besides the graph structure, each node is also described by its own descriptive vector, which is the xi vector. And then we model the release of a called item as actually the addition of a new node in the graph. The difference is that we will have the xi vector, but the node will be observed as isolated. And from this perspective, our problem consists in a link prediction task. We would like to predict the locations, but also the weights of the nodes of the edges that should come out of this new node. So link predictions, link prediction in graph is not a new problem, okay? It's been widely studied by the graph community, and improvements were recently achieved by methods that try to learn node representations. So the idea is that instead of directly working with the graph structure, you will try to map the nodes into a low-dimensional vector space, a node embedding. So each node i will be associated to an embedding vector zi. And then in embeddings, you can compute distances. So 
falling prediction, you could say that two very close nodes in the embedding will be likely to be connected, and that's what we will do. So specifically in this work, we learn embeddings using a graph autoencoder. I provide all technical details in the paper, but what you can rem remember is that first, this is a neural model that takes into account both the graph and the descriptions. This is desirable to learn an embedding that captures both the usage and the musical information. Also, the model will be specifically optimized falling prediction, so we can hope to effectively reconstruct edges from the embedding. And last but not least, it can incorporate new nodes. So what you can do is first train an embedding on the warm nodes and subsequently project new nodes in the embedding using the model that you train. And you can do so even if the node is isolated using only the descriptions. Nonetheless, graph autoencoders, they were originally introduced for undirected graphs. And since once again we have directed graphs, we'll instead use an extension of these models. They are called gravity-inspired graph autoencoders, and they have been proposed by our team two years ago. So in a nutshell, let's say that you learn your embedding, and now you want to predict if i is connected to j. In standard graph autoencoders, you would usually rely on inner products or distances in the embedding. But these are symmetric functions. So if you predict that i is connected to j, you will also predict that j is connected to i with the same probability, which, of course, is undesirable for us. To address this problem, gravity-inspired graph autoencoders will learn embedding vectors, as before, but also a new mass parameter for each node. And then we transpose ideas from physics in the embedding. So specifically, to reconstruct directed edges, we will use equations that are inspired from physical acceleration due to gravity. It looks like this. I have to skip a lot of details, but what you can remember is two things. First, as before, we will continue to assess that two closed nodes will be likely to be connected, thanks to this distance term on the right. But now the nodes will also be more likely to connect to the most massive node. They will be attracted to them, OK? As an illustration, we applied this method on our graph of similar artists at Deezer. So you can see that proximity in the embedding is still, to some extent, linked to musical similarity, OK? For instance, the nodes in red are all Jamaican reggae artists, and indeed, they are recommended together in our production system. But now, nodes also have masses. Here, Bob Marley is very massive. He will therefore try to tend to attract the others and to appear on top of their similar artist list. More generally, in our model, if a node is equally close to two others, it will more likely tend to the most massive nodes. And on the contrary, if two nodes are equally massive, we will more likely point to the closest one. So we balance between influence and proximity in the embedding. So I hope that's clear. This visualization actually comes from the following graph of artists extracted from Deezer. Our similarity scores are computed in productions from uh, data from millions of active users. In essence, they are based on mutual information scores from the co-occurrences of artists among streams. So roughly, we compare the probability to listen to two artists simultaneously to their global respective uh, frequencies on the service, and the scores are normalized by some private internal heuristics. I recall that we are in a directed setting, so A can be in the top list of B, while B is not in the top list of A, okay? Last, we also have 56-dimensional description vectors. We concatenate various information about music mood, music genre, countries, and they are all detailed in the paper. And then we consider the following split. So we artificially masked the edges of some cold nodes, and our goal is to project these nodes in an embedding already trained on the warm, on some other warm nodes, and using the gravity formula to hopefully retrieve these missing edges. So we are interested in two things, prediction accuracy, of course, but we also look for ranking quality. So are the retrieved edges correctly ordered in terms of similarity scores? To measure that, we also include, we therefore include ranking metrics. So we compared our model to several popularity baselines, we also considered methods that mainly or only use the descriptive vectors xi. For instance, a simple baseline that uh, recommends the k closest the I vec xi vector using a KNN. Nonetheless, we outperform these simple baselines by some more complex hybrid models that takes into account both the available warm usage information and the descriptive information of all artists. Some are graph-based methods, some are not. Actually, if you use standard graph autoencoders, you don't necessarily get the best results. But if you incorporate uh, the gravity-inspired components, then you can get some promising results. 
I think it tends to show that uh, taking into account the influence of the nodes is it's quite important, as well as taking into account the directionality of edges, and that's something that we explicitly do. So I will stop here, but the paper contains much more details and experiments. For instance, uh, we propose a variant of our model based on variational autoencoders. It was in the previous figure. Uh, I also discussed some scalability con constraints and uh, concerns, which are, of course, very important for industrial applications. I also show that once you have the masses, you can artificially increase or decrease the relative importance in the gravity formula. And as a consequence, you can recommend more or less popular content and to some extent address popularity biases. Last, in the paper, we also have experiments where we uh, try to understand what is actually learned by the masses. Like, is that really the popularity on Deezer? Is that the centrality in the graph? We show that no, not exactly. But I can come back to it later if you want, uh, because everything is in the paper. I therefore invite you to take a look. Thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, <coughs> for a nice talk. Um, there are a few questions online. Uh, if you have questions here as well, please approach the microphone. Uh, I'll start with a, a question from Fabien Guillon. Uh, who asks, where do the new artist's attributes, so genre, mode, country, come from initially? Sorry, where, where, do, where do they come from? Yeah. Uh, they come from Deezer. Okay. So they are used on, uh, by Deezer. And uh, the data set that we use, an anonymized version of this data set, obviously, is uh, provided with the paper online. Okay. So I have a sort of rel related question to that. Yeah. Uh, in your paper, you, s you list that 32 of these dimensions, they come from the countries, yeah. and those are uh, listens or listening events. Uh, this, so these are already played songs. Uh, have you considered what would happen if you would remove these listening events and only use the other vectors or the other dimensions? Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a kind of an ablation study in the paper where we show the impact of each kind of information, so we have that in the paper. I want to emphasize that uh, we have no listening data for, for the cold artists. So the only uh, information that we use are descriptive information from uh, the, the music genres, so information provided when we receive the music, information about the country, when it's available, information about the music moods. They are competed internally, but they are not using uh, usage data. So I am in a very particular case of cold start where you have absolutely no usage uh, data. You have nothing, and still you want to recommend some content. Okay. But it raises, uh, if, if I can elaborate, maybe it raises an important question. Uh, the question is how you can actually compute this similarity scores. I mean, uh, we are in a setting where we have absolutely nothing, but we could be interested in a setting where we have a very few uh, usage data, some listening data, but not enough to be considered as warm and incrementally update the similarity scores. And that's definitely something that could, I think, improve the, the method. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question from the audience here. Yes. yes. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk. I really like seeing these kind of graph interpretations of the space. Um, I was wondering, especially with this gravity approach and a reliance on metadata for the cold start problem, whether you see some issues surrounding the complementary or substitutive goods analogy. So artists that are extremely similar to each other probably are substitutes and people will prefer one over the other. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the space, there would, their, their interactions would be kind of nonlinear in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see any potential problems around substantive or complementary artists? And if you see them, would you consider extending the model in some way to account for that? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't think that we take that into account in the paper to answer shortly. Uh, I think that if you have uh, two nodes who have the same masses and that are equally close from you, you will get the same predictions. Nevertheless, in post-production, you could do uh, something to avoid recommending the same content. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So uh, there's a few uh, questions online that are mm -hmm. uh, sort of similar. So um, Daniel, Daniel Woolridge and Andrew Foster are asking, how do you define the artist mass? Uh, and how do the new artists acquire mass when the gravity term seems to suppress them? Well, they, yes, the, that's the part that I didn't detail. It, uh, 
they are trained by the, the graph autoencoder. So the, in a graph autoencoder, you have two components. You have an encoder and a decoder. The encoder will take as input the graph, so the adjacency matrix of the graph and the, the features, and will return uh, the embedding, so an embedding matrix stacking up the embedding vectors of all uh, the nodes, and in our case, an additional dimension, which, which will be the, the mass. And then you will have a decoder. The decoder will take as input these embedding uh, vectors and the masses, and will try to reconstruct the graph. And the intuition behind autoencoders is that if, starting from the embedding, the low dimensional embedding, you're able to reconstruct a graph that is close to the original one, then it should mean that uh, in this embedding you manage to preserve some important characteristics or structures from the original graph. And therefore, so we have an encoder which is a graph convolutional network that takes as input the graph and return uh, a big vector for each node. So all the dimension but the last will be the actual ZI vector, the embedding vector, and the last one will be the mass. And a decoder that will try to, to reconstruct the graph from the gravity formula. And then we have uh, a loss, which is a reconstruction loss, that will compare the prediction for each edge to the original version of the graph. And that's why I'm saying that it's specifically optimized for link prediction. By design, if you take two ZI vectors and their corresponding masses, you should be able to predict if I and J are connected. OK? Thank you. Uh, there are still more questions online, so I, I, yeah. I, I recommend that you check out those. Uh, the next talk uh, will be a pre-recorded one. Oh, thank you.